This con this conference will now be recorded. All right, everyone, I'm going to find a way to turn my face off here. Uh, let's see. Oh, I just stepped in myself. That's not helpful. All right, so I'm going to be talking today about soil biology, um, which is really a rough overview. Definitely not uh, all inclusive, and uh, but hopefully enough to really get you guys going. Those of you that are working in the in the fields of landscape. Uh, planning and helping your clients move to a more sustainable and healthier for them uh, management program, as well as those of you who are in arboriculture and are interested specifically in tree health as a result of soil biology and soil health. All right, so my name is Dr. Elizabeth Hamilton. I own Better Nature LLC, which is now, um, in the process of becoming Better Nature Solutions, which is a nonprofit that's devoted to increasing the representation, presentation, and business ownership of women from groups that are typically not well employed or underemployed or not stably employed. So, Better Nature Solutions provides stable, well paid employment with benefits for women from those communities in the landscape of poor culture and related or alliant um, industries. And we also require education of our apprentices and then team members in various aspects of biology and ecology, including soils. So they'll be taking this class and uh, having to do some tests in order to move from an apprenticeship program to a permanent program. If you wanna find out more about Better Nature Solutions, how you can support us, or if you're interested in becoming a board member, please, please, please reach out to me. Uh, the website right now favors the LLC. I can only tackle so many things at one time, right? You guys all know this. So um, it's for sadly like 11th or 12th on the to-do list, but eventually this will be completely and totally the nonprofit's website. All right, so the outline is presented here and it would be super fantastic if i could get rid of all this stuff that's on my screen so i could see it better there we go oh that didn't help you either did it let's just go through it this way all right is okay so here is how we're going to go so we're going to talk about what soils are and their structure how do they differ um, in terms of types of soil and what that means in terms of what's living in them, um, what can live in them. We're gonna talk a little bit about organic matter, what it is and how to cultivate it. Fixing fertility, which is not easy peasy, but it may be simpler than you think. And sadly, we are going to be addressing the topic of pH, which the sad part is um, many extension specialists say that you cannot change pH and you can indeed change soil pH. Um, Ask anybody in the cannabis industry. Even if you're not working with hydroponics, though, I have used some of the tools in hydroponics as well as elemental sulfur. Uh, certainly lime is used all the time to change pH uh, and also limit what can grow there in turf industry, golf course industry, baseball industry. So people are not putting a bunch of money into um, liming or sulfuring their soils if the pH cannot be changed. It can be changed. And sometimes that's necessary to get the microbial community assemblage, so who's there, which microbes are there, um, that you want based on what you're growing and where you're growing it. We are losing soils, healthy soils. Soils turns out healthy soils are a finite resource. You all may have heard of the American Dust Bowl and what happened that led to um, uh, not only um, tremendous amount or number of people who were starving um, and you know ran from places like Oklahoma where they could no longer grow plants because literally the soil had been so degraded that it had become because of farming practices that it had become this loose topsoil that was blowing off in the wind and no longer arable. So 
if you look at USDA or you look at CIFOR, that's C-I-F-O-R, or other organizations that are tracking soil health, arable lands, how much food we can grow for how many people we have on the earth, et cetera, you'll find some real concerns about the soil as a finite resource on the globe, this, the kind of soil we can grow things in. All right, and how can we protect our soils from climate change, including the little beasties that live in the soils? All right, so that's the outline. I've already spent too much time on it. So what is soil? It's not dirt. Dirt is uh, defined as the debris that is like the dust throughout your house, the cobwebs, the dust mites. Um, sure, it could be soil included. Uh, so it's dirt is more all encompassing the soil. Um, soil is more of a, a a matrix within which living organisms exist. It anchors plant roots and it has a Google, so that's a gazillion, bazillion number of microbes, arthropods, plant roots that are all mixed with rock, which is sort of the primary substrate from which soils begin or, or evolve, I use that term loosely, um, as well as soils, air, and water. It consists of minerals, these pores that are different sizes that are great for gas exchange, that's air, as well as the movement, or if it's there's too few of the pores or they're too small, the lack of movement of water. I live in a very clay soil right now in uh, East Tennessee, and we had um, some snowfall and previous days of really warm but rainy weeks. And now it's raining again. The soils are already saturated because the clay soils, they're not gonna, that water's not gonna percolate through in many places because there's too few pores. The soil has been compacted by a lot of development, urban development. And so that water is just going to run off, uh, creating erosions, we're losing our soils and also flooding. And then soil also includes dead organic matter as well as living organisms. All right. so. There are minerals in it, which are pretty much small bits of weathered rock. We talked about over here being foundational to the development of soil. Um, and the organic matter, these are bits of animal and plant remnant sort of coming from above. So you've got two major components of soil that contribute to its fertility or health. Minerals coming from the bottom up, the rock up, and organic matter pretty much coming from the top down into the soils. All right, so soil structure is defined as a result of the composition of different particles. Uh, clay is your, gonna be your finest particle size. So it's got the smallest size in the microns um, and therefore the largest actual surface area, okay? So the volume to the surface area is gonna be the highest in clay and the lowest in sand, which is the largest uh, soil structure component, loam and silt, somewhere in between these two. Um, composition is also a result of weather or the aggregation of water and air over time, over seasons, over decades, over eons. That lead to whether or not, for example, um, on the Magellan Rim of uh, the Grand Canyon, there's very poor soil development on the ridges and the higher areas because that soil is developing from a rock bed that was volcanic. Um, it's very dry there, uh, lots of frequent fires. And because of this, you don't get a lot of accumulation of organic matter coming from leaf material or woody debris or a lot of insects because fewer the plants, the fewer the insects. And so soil formation on the Magellan Rim on these volcanic uh, soils, historically volcanic soils is very, very slow. Whereas where I'm living right now, um, soil development up in the Rocky, eh, sorry, not the Rocky Mountains, Smoky Mountains can be minimal, but I'm in a valley. And because of that, a lot of the silt and soil erodes downhill and into these ridge and valleys that I live in, that Knoxville is situation, situated in. So you can get these ridges where there's not the greatest, uh, it's better than say the, of the Smoky Mountains, but it's not as good as the soil in the valley components, where those are full of silty loams. Soil aggregation is really critical to root health as well as the movement of air and water. So 
Microbes are terrific at helping create these aggregates or clumps of soil. The microbes exude, especially fungi, for example, will exude these sticky compounds. And those sticky compounds get all these different particle parts together, adhering together or aggregating. And when those aggregate, that creates larger pores or more and or more pores for the water, the roots, the microbes, and the air to move through. An abundance in a diversity of plants will lead to changes in the nutrient availability and soil health. This is due to feedback cycles. Feedback cycles can be positive or negative. In this case, if you think about it this way, you've got the higher the diversity of plants, that means the higher diversity of roots in the soil, that means an increased probability of attracting a more diverse bacterial and fungal community, a higher diversity of arthropods living above ground and on the ground that feed on the different plant parts or prefer to feed on different types of um, decaying plant parts. And all of that leads to increased nutrient availability, increased soil aggregation, breakdown of clay, moving soils more to loamy silt, and thus you get sort of a positive feedback. The higher the abundance and diversity of plants, the higher abundance and diversity of microbes and arthropods. That means more organic matter, that means more clay soil aggregation, and basically better physical structure and nutrient availability in those soils. So weathering of rock types or pedology is a combination of, you know, eons of climatic change that include snow melts, water movement through the soil layer, and the geology underlying. So granite, these are just, this is a gross generalization, okay? So granite will typically lead to silty sandy soils, whereas basalt, that's your volcanic, is gonna lead to clay rich soils. So those um, basalt mountains in Arizona produce clay rich soils um, in the valleys that are in, found in those mountains. Shales or slates are also gonna be clay and silty clays. There's a lot of shale and slate in Indiana, uh, northern Indiana, where the um, ice, uh, ice Age impacted the upper part of the state and helped break down the shale and slate, making it a very rich soil. Silty clays are terrific soils to grow plants in. Sandstone, you're also going to find a lot of sand-dominated uh, areas, say in New Mexico, where the substrate is primarily sandstone. And limestone tends to lead to clay and silty clays. Silty clays are again going to be in response of not only the limestone substrate, but also um, the topography and the weather or climatic conditions of the area they're found in. So everything in ecology and maybe even geology is context dependent. I know a lot about geology, so I'm going out on a limb there. All right, surface soils are where things live, right? Or should live if they're not sterile soils. Um, and they're typically granular and crumbly. Subsoils, so that's below the surface, say 10 centimeters down or three centimeters down, depending upon how much soil development you experience where you live, those are gonna be more blocky soils. So they're gonna be typically be um, prismatic, so shaped like prisms or columnar with more rounded edges or they can be very platy. Out here, they're very platy. So if you've seen any of my videos on Instagram, digging into some really terrible subsoils that are the result of um, housing developments scraping away the topsoil, you'll see those are all platy soils in there. When I lived out in the desert areas, I would often see prismatic and columnar soils where the topsoil had eroded away from wind and then that rain dry cycle that is endemic to deserts would lead to the, the surfacing and the really visual, kind of a cool visual uh, impact of seeing those clays, those columnar and prismatic clays dry um, in these very distinct um, linear patterns. What we hope to find on the top of these subsoils are some nice granular and crumbly surface soils, which the deeper, the better, because that's where the roots are really gonna wanna hang out and thrive in. This is gonna be a harder habitat for most trees. Some plants have evolved to tolerate and thrive in these habitats, but they are the exception. 
All right, so weather impacts soil compactness through aggregation of particles. Okay, so um, if you have weather it, that favors um, free a lot of freeze thaw or uh, drought um, flood cycles, then aggregation is going to be poor. Um, in the sense that you're going to have compaction more likely, or you're going to have massive aggregates that are that are very difficult for organisms, including plant roots, to penetrate, and too large of spaces in between. Um, wetting and drying cycles, obviously, they're going to impact, like I said, right here. Um, and then if drying cycles are elongated and the soils are sterile or lack a lot of diversity, living organisms in there, then these are going to erode rapidly. Microbial activity and exudates, um, they're terrific at breaking up soils. You can think of the mi microbes, the fungi, they're fungal hyphae, which are like these long spaghetti strands that could be 30 meters in length or more. They're moving through the soil, or those little bacterial bodies that are billion gazillion, are moving through the soil. They're exuding these sticky, slimy exudates that allow them to move through pores that they're creating. So they're sort of like engineers in the soil. So not only are they breaking up the soil clay and then forming these new aggregates that will be able to hold on to nutrients, but in sandy soils, they can also exude these um, sticky substances and help with the aggregation of sand to reduce the massive pore size that we find in sandy soils. Root and arthropod animal excavation are all doing the same thing as what I just talked about here. They're little uh, engineers. Uh, root exudates are also going to determine soil compactness in sort of an indirect way because these chemical uh, chemistries that are released from the roots can act as triggers to say, hey, arthropod, you think that you like to eat organic matter? I'm over here, I'm shedding some old roots, come on over here and chow down and then poop out some nutrients for me. Or, hey, you uh, microbial partner, I'm over here, you wanna hang out and help each other out? Uh, create a little cooperative. And then of course, larger annual and seasonal weather patterns will have an impact on soil compactness, which is a, a really um, important topic of research in terms of agriculture, soil health, soil abundance, and climate change. I won't get into that here. All right, so as we talked about a little bit already, soil composition is composed of three size types, clay, tinest, tiniest, the most surface area. So the smaller you are relative to another thing, even though it's gonna seem like you have less surface area, the surface area relative to the volume of your body is gonna be larger, okay? So I have more surface area than someone larger than me relative to the volume of my body, and the same is true for clay. If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't really have to. Just remember that it has more surface area relative to the volume, and because of that, it can hold on to a lot more ions. Those could be potassium, cations or chlorine anions. Regardless, clay is able to hold on to a lot of nutrients that plants need. The question is, is it holding on to them so tight the plants can't get it? Clays are also going to have the lowest porosity. That means lower gas exchange and slower water movement through the system, higher water retention within the system. So that's where you're going to have favorable conditions for oomycetes and other pathogenic fungi that have to hang out in watery environments. Um, I know there's some discussion whether or not oomycetes are actually fungi, but I'm just going to call them that for now. Silt is the intermediate size uh, and thus surface area, and so it's moderately strong at holding cations and ions. Anions. Uh, Cations are positively charged, anions are negatively charged, ions are just the combination of both, as moderate porosity. Sand is the largest least surface area, it's weak ionic bonding attraction, so its CEC is gonna be quite low, and it has very large pore size. Loam 
that thing that we all love to get to if you're a gardener or a urban horticulturalist um, is the combination of all these above particle size particle sizes in that sweet spot where things tend to thrive. So soil is composed of visible earthworms and arthropods. We see these all the time if we're hanging out and digging around the soils. And it's also composed of visible as well as microscopic plant roots. So a lot of the plant hairs that are microscopic are really doing the majority of work in terms of nutrient uptake and um, controlling drought use efficiency or water use efficiency, not drought, but water use efficiency. Those uh, little teeny tiny hairs on those new roots that cycle through the body of the plant fast, those are playing a critical role in the nutrition and water uptake of the plant. Organic matter, the amount, diversity of organic matter is gonna depend upon the abundance of plants because they are the primary trophic level, so the primary feeding level, everything feeds on them as well as the more diversity of tree leaf types you have um, or the more abundance then the more potential for abundant organic matter provided you don't have those jumping worms microscopic arthropods and microscopic things like fungi and bacteria are critically important in soil breakdown of organic matter these visible things break it down to a certain size then the microscopic ones break it down further and then those even smaller than the microscopic arthropods break it down even further and eventually or different stages are pooping out resources the plants can use. Their movement through the soil um, is also, as we already talked about, conducive to these different parameters in the soil the characteristics. Okay. So large arthropods are excavating the soil, adding porosity. Okay. So your um, nematodes are not your large arthropods. It's gonna be the beetles that you might see moving through, the centipedes, the millipedes, um, even the earwigs. These are all going to help with excavating soils. Um, they also shred, shred the plant detritus, making it accessible to smaller organisms. Smaller organisms further shred it, like I just said. Uh, all of these guys are pooping out nutrients, uh, literally and figuratively. And then plant roots can form relationship with the microbes, allowing plants to access more soil, not directly through root elongation necessarily, by, but by making a relationship with, say, fungi that have those long fungal strands that can go out 30 meters. And so now this plant that originally would have been dedicated to harvesting resources in this patch of soil got this relationship with say a mycorrhizal fungi and now we can harvest water and nutrients way out here. So we have the positive feedback cycle because the first trophic level are plants so everything feeds on them so the more diversity of types of plants of species of plants of sizes shapes uh, carbon nitrogen ratios in their leaves more diversity than the more diversity of arthropods the more diversity of birds and other animals that feed on those arthropods or the birds, and the more diversity of different types of organisms in the soil that will help break down the organic matter and increase the nutrients available to those plants, thereby increasing their growth and abundance, and you get a positive feedback cycle. Organic matter is plant material and nutrients released from nature by nature. The more microbes and the greater diversity, the faster you're gonna get that organic matter made. That's one reason why compost, your compost is gonna be healthier if you have more types of food sources in it. Um, so used to not be able to compost cheese, but in certain um, composting methods and in areas of the country, you can compost these. But let's say you can't compost these, even if you're just composting these, the more diversity you have of this mixed with leaf litter, grass cuttings, then, and the more that you're rotating that, then the better compost you're gonna get, right? So if you had compost where you're just piling alternately turf grass cuttings and straw, that first of all, isn't gonna break down very fast. And second, it's not really gonna be that great a compost in terms of the nutrients and quality of 
of sustenance it's providing to the plants in the soil. Play with organic matter is a great environment for plants. And why would that be, based on what you've heard already? I'm not gonna answer that, because I think you guys already know. Hummus, or humus, not hummus, humus is the result of microbes and organic matter leading to this perfect aggregation that makes this thing called humus that's nice environmentally for roots and organisms to live in and also has a high nutrient value. Things that you can add to the soil to make a happy organic matter habitat for other organisms are things like biochar, biochar. you can add organisms, those are biofertilizers, bacteria and fungi, uh, wood, pine, and straw mulches, gypsum, Epsom salts, because it's a magnesium that's critically important in the making of cells, and also transferring of electrical signals and little living bodies that have neurologic pathways, which is pretty much everything um, from arthropods up. Uh, cover crops are excellent as well, especially if you're picking cover crops that are going to have high say rhizobial membership with them so they're going to be able to release nitrogen or cover crops that have a, a low carbon to nitrogen ratio those are also going to degrade rapidly things like uh oak leaves are good in organic matter buildup but not great so they're good because they actually provide habitat for your um little beasties that decompose other leaf material or pollinate your plants later in the spring and summer but they have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, so they do not break down rapidly. Uh, tulip tree leaves are going to break down rapidly. Any of your thin, uh, flimsy leaves are going to be break down rapidly. Wood ash from the fireplace is also great. Uh, and I like to use cocoa core as well, not only in my um, organic, not only in my compost bin, but also when I'm making soil. No peat moss, please. Peat moss is a limiting resource and the harvesting of peat moss is causing massive damage worldwide to peatlands as well as increasing the amount of methane the worst greenhouse gas um, being emitted into the atmosphere things you do not want to do to build up organic matter in your soils compost bin or not you do not want to lightly or note you want to oh, i did this wrong things you do want to do are light or no-till um, farming. So when I am planting a new flower bed, I do not till it up because I do not want to break up the soil aggregation that might be healthy there. Um, tilling can also, if you're going to walk over that afterwards or run equipment over afterwards, will increase compaction. So tilling followed by heavy equipment, increased compaction prior to what you have before. And it also wakes up the weedy seed bank. So see, a lot of weedy seeds can live in the soil just waiting for the chance to be like brought up by an insect, arthropod, or human. And then once they get enough air and water access, then they germinate. And so tilling will actually increase the amount of weedy seeds you get germinating. You do not want to remove your autumn leaf fall. Okay, You need that organic matter for the spring and summer and for your overwintering arthropods to thrive and survive and feed your birds, pollinate your plants next spring and also feed your birds during the winter. Pesticides, herbicides, or the over application of either or wrongly applied can lead to um, loss of incre incredibly important arthropods and microbes that will break down that organic matter. And what I often find is that soils in the urban landscape are actually sterile. They have been addicted to pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers for so long, they no longer have much or a sufficient amount of microbial community abundance or assemblages to support the plants. And so those soils are, they've been fed a crappy diet for years on end, and they cannot support a healthy um, suite of organisms. They're sterile, essentially. And so we have to keep applying those um, fertilizers. And the, thing, the other thing you wanna do is increase soil compaction by parking your car or other heavy equipment, say under the canopy of a tree, um, or soil compaction by you know putting in a new deck that's concrete based right by your beloved huge old maple that soil compaction is can be the death to the roots 
fixing soil fertility. If you have bad soil fertility, two of the things that I love to add, in addition to biochar, are fulvic and humic acids along with my microbes. So the humic and fulvic acids can provide a great substrate upon which those microbes can feed. So you're feeding or giving the microbes the vitamin and minerals, so to speak, the healthy diet they need to thrive in. And then they in turn will help your plants that you're growing thrive. Um, inorganic fertilizers uh, can be used, uh, but the more additions of NPK um, inorganic fertilizers that you apply, that one applies, the increased saltiness of that soil. So a lot of these are in ions that are going to create a salty uh, residue. So if you've been using, say, miracle Grow in your plants or one of the orchid fertilizers, your indoor plants, you might often see that white crusty stuff at the top if you've been fertilizing a lot. And that is that salty residue that results from overuse of NPKs without flushing those soils out or those orchid substrates out with a lot of water. Bone meal is a direct infusion of slow release phosphorus and blood meal is a direct infusion of slow release nitrogen. Blood meal is really gonna be high in amino acids as opposed to nitrogen and amino acids are much more accessible for ready use and ease of use, efficiency of use for the microbes that are gonna um, degrade that blood meal and then make it, uh, turn that nitrogen into a form that's available for plant roots to uptake. I like to add both the bone meal and the blood meal um, whenever I'm dealing with really thick clay soils uh, that haven't been amended for a while and say I want to put in a vegetable garden or, or a new flower garden. Over fertilization is harder to correct, uh, like I said, because of the sterility factor of over fertilization. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer to correct, it's going to be more expensive to correct. Um, so it's better to under fertilize and then figure out what your plants need. There's some great apps that you can use on your phone that might help you to identify what the nutrient limitations are, if it's a micro or a macronutrient. Identifying nutrient limitations by plant leaf coloration or discoloration or other deformities is a challenging, challenging exercise. So be patient with yourself, read, um, confer with uh, people at the university or your gardening club or extension specialists to identify whether or not you're right and um, with your analysis or the app is right and just give yourself a lot of room for trial and error to learn. Planting the right plant in the right place in terms of the soil it's going to be experiencing, is it clay or sandy or silt? Uh, the amount of sun, moisture, pH of the soil, all of that is going to make your life much easier if you match the plant to the environment it is best suited, it has evolved to live in. So a lot of times I see dogwoods in open, full sun. They are not gonna thrive. Some of the cultivars have been developed to thrive, but if you've got like, you know, your native dogwoods, they are an understory tree and they flower in the understory. So they want at least dappled light, you know, so they want maybe partial sun. So give them a little bit more shade and their trunks will be less likely to burn and they will be more likely to thrive and be able to resist diseases and other pests. Um, how soil pH affects the availability of plant nutrients. I'm sure you guys have all seen this if you've been gardening or playing with plants for any amount of time. So you, you know the sweet spot, right? But you also know that that sweet spot for the macronutrients it's not necessarily the sweet spot for the micronutrients. So you may have to supplement. A lot of times micronutrients are a more important deficiency than these macros. Potassium is often very high in most soils and not something that ever has to be added. It's just that it's not accessible to plants because these micronutrients that are used to facilitate potassium uptake are maybe not in alignment. Uh, continuing on with fixing soil. So this is showing you uh, a root, um, what a you know, microscopic root, what it looks like growing through the soil. Alkaline clays, you want to add the elemental sulfur. I typically add um, the pellets because they're easier for me to get a hold of. Uh, less, um, it's 
sort of caustic it to apply. Uh, if you're going to apply the powder, definitely wear a, ma a mask and some good full coverage clothing and, and gloves because it will dry you out. And who knows, you might even have a, a nasty reaction to it. If you have low potassium, which you really want to do a soil test first and look at those micro micronutrients first, try to adjust the micronutrients. But if you adjust the micronutrients, you do another soil test, you still have low potassium availability, then potassium sulfate. And alkaline soils is the way to go. And that's because it's got that sulfur compound with it um, to help release, to help change the pH to release that potassium that might be too tightly bound to those clay with the large surface area particles. Potassium is a very large molecule and it will knock off other molecules, making them not attached to the soil, but instead move rapidly like nitrogen and phosphorus through the soil system via water. And so it's not that your soils are not getting sufficient NPK, it's just that there's so much K sometimes and that it's just blocking all that surface area and that clay particle that other things cannot attach to it. This could be macronutrients or micronutrients. And so oftentimes you'll get with large amounts of potassium in clay soils, a magnesium and or calcium deficiency. It's why um, you get bitter pit in apples because of these magnesium and calcium deficiencies. Bitter pit um, is often misconstrued for early young gardeners to be a, a disease, but it's not, it's a micronutrient deficiency. Potassium is critical for flowering. So test to make sure that the calcium remains vi available so that you have both of these working together so they get a good floral display. Acidic clay soils, you wanted to add limestone or dolomite. Wood ash, which will add a lot of calcium carbonate. It's really important to deal with that um, acidity. And of course, you want to measure it annually with soil tests and apply sparingly until you have your ideal pH. Too much repeated nitrogen fertilization can lead to clay acidity or acidic soils in general. And acidic soils below 5.0 can cause aluminum toxicity. So the aluminum is usually safely bound in soils that have a pH higher than 5.0, but at lower, they become loose in the soil and start to move around and cause that um, aluminum toxicity, which will express itself in poor root growth as well as other distortions in the plant. Okay, so looking at some of the reasons why these um, macronutrients are so important is because they have a tremendous number of roles in the plant and in the cells of all organisms. Potassium is a critical component of opening these um, very expensive, very important chambers. This is a cell wall. And in order for certain large molecules to go from outside of the cell to the inside, and then provide that sustenance to the inside of the cell so it can make stuff or be moved to the outside of the cell to be shared with other cells. Potassium is often something that's involved with um, the opening of these um, channels. There are specific potassium ion channels. Um, potassium can enhance resistance to pests and diseases, uh, regulates water status, increase drought tolerance, Okay, so in the leaves, so it has something to do with um, cavitation or resistance to cavitation in the vascular tissue. It's involved in building and strengthening the plants. I mean, there's almost no role in plant growth development and sustenance or sustainability. That means it's longevity uh, that potassium does not play a role in. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the same because pretty much the backbone of DNA is phosphorus and the amino acids are composed of nitrates, lots of nitrogen compounds in those amino acids. And so they're incredibly important for the plants to have in order to grow cells, repair cells, maintain cellular homeostasis. So we need a healthy microbial community to produce amino, amino acids and recycle nutrients, right? So the amino acids can readily convert in like fermented food products, kelp, ground fish, and cod into different types of proteins or enzymes, okay? So fermented food products have been enzymatically broken down, right? 
Uh, and we can therefore access a lot of amino acids by applying these very same things to our soils and thereby feeding our microbial communities. There are caveats, which I will address later. Some examples of what micronutrients do in a plant include iron and its impact on enzymatic systems, um, so being able to break things down, um, or yeah, basically break things down, like maybe proteins into smaller parts, or waste in a cell, uh, formation of proteins, the creation of chlor chlorophylls, and also metabolism of other macro micronutrients. Um, something like boron is very important in protein formation, hormones in the plant, so that's going to be important in flowering, fruit production, a metabolism of these kinds of other nutrients, seed development, again, hormones, that makes sense, um, and carbon translocation. So these are some of the different types of uh, minerals, and micronutrients that are critically important in cell function in plants as well as in other organisms. Where do you get your nutrients and what else do you get? Sometimes not such great things. So kelp meal, because of what we're doing to the oceans, can often test high for arsenic. So do you wanna use kelp meal that you don't know the, the provenance of in your vegetable garden? Probably not. Fish meals can also test high in nickel and lead. Again, maybe it's fine to use in your flower garden or your uh, um, wildlife prairie because some of those plants, many of those plants and microbes are actually gonna be able to sequester some of these nasty compounds, but it's not really something you wanna use in your organic vegetable garden. I've said this before, but herbicides combined with pesticides can lead to severe toxicity in soils, bad for your plants, definitely bad for your health, probably bad for your pets, certainly bad for your kids. And really the synergistic interactions and the impacts of those synergistic interactions are unknown, right? So no one's done the research to figure out whether or not, um, you know, the herbicides that you're using and the pesticides and herbicides your neighbor's using that are then combining in the water and air around your adjacent houses have increased toxicity or maybe reduced toxicity to you, your animals, your kids, your neighbors. We just don't know because that research is pretty much not funded, and so it's not done. Um, typically mixing chemistry in the industry I work in, which is pesticide application, herbicide application, you don't mix chemistries unless you know how they mix, right? Um, whether it's a favorable mixture or whether it's gonna create a noxious compound that you can't then breathe, right? Or solidifies into something you can't um, spread. The point being that when you mix chemicals, things happen. And we, since we don't know what they are, it's better to be safe than sorry. Soil tests, so incredibly important to building soil nutrient pools that are stable. I do soil testing, including density, carbon exchange capacity, and micronutrients on a regular basis for my clients. Whenever we're putting in a landscape or garden, I ask them to pay for this. So important to start with knowing what your soils are doing and how healthy they are. Based on those results, you can do a design strategy. Do you need to shift to um, plants that are more acid loving in your particular environment? Will that reduce the amount of management and this, the amount of product you have to buy to keep those acid loving plants happy in an alkaline soil? You're able to answer those kinds of questions. Whether or not you need to be adding NPK or micronutrients to make your slightly maybe yellowing leaves a little bit richer and greener and flowering more. I will note that most facilities will give you an ag-based recommendation. That can be really hard to translate in general if you're not used to reading soil test outputs, but it's also can be challenged if you're working in an urban environment where you're dealing with the you know tree health specifically or you're dealing with your um, master gardener plot or whatever, right? It's difficult to translate that. And so um, there are people like me and others, there's the soil doctor, you can see him on Instagram, who can help you translate um, those ag-based recommendations into something that's actually useful for, for what you need it for.
Remember, your strategy is context dependent, and that is because ecology, ecology is context dependent. I'd say everything in biology is context dependent. So COVID is an excellent, excellent example of that. Okay, maybe not two excellence, maybe just have an excellent example of that. So how people have gotten sick as a result and the percentage of people who've gotten sick has been context dependent. It's dependent upon the percentage of the population that just has inherent resistance to it versus the percentage of the population with pre-existing conditions. That context is often a result of um, uh, wealth or access to medical resources that are abundant. That's gonna change across the globe. Access to vaccines is also quite different across the globe. So really everything in biology is context dependent. So what are your starting conditions? This is why the soils test is so important. What are you growing? What does it like to grow in? Where does it like to grow? Does it need a lot of wind? Like your orchids are epiphytes. They grow in the tops of trees, most of them. And so they like a lot of wind. Um, what are you willing to do to remediate your soils? Do you want to use bio meals or do you want to use cover crops? Cover crops might take a little bit more work, but the bio meals might, or the bio fertilizers might take a little bit more time. You know, these are trade-offs you can make. And of course you can experiment as well, because that's one of the really fun things about gardening or farming, so urban farming. So if you're experimenting as an arborist, that's not such a great thing. I mean, I do it, I think we all do it because there's so little research out there to provide us with great data, because you know trees just don't get that much funding love, as, as I think they should, I'm biased. Um, and so we have to do a little bit of experimentation, but you don't really wanna experiment the way you might be willing to do so in your own garden. All right, so grassland studies show that increased biomass of organic matter um, in three to four year timelines can show that can have plants that are more resilient to fungal disease. All right, okay, so grassland studies so the increasing biomass organic matter within a three to five year timeline leads to more resilient plants in terms of those that are exposed to fungal diseases. Peach is the driving force for microbial species diversity first. And the second driving force of pH is in terms of plant diversity. So saying that pH is not important or doesn't need to be addressed, I think is not looking at the fact that the microbial community under our feet can literally be an ocean of diversity and it has critical, significant, long-term impacts on the health of the soil, the structure of the soil, and thus the health of plants. Not only their nutritional health, but also their defense system health. Microbes do a lot to provide antioxidant defenses to plants. Health soil loss. Typo, typo warning, can I change it? Nope. All right, so healthy soil loss. So the USDA and international groups have been fighting to stop soil loss for quite some time. It is a huge issue. So it's estimated that soil typically has a 100-year lifespan based on the way that we, we treat it. Soil erosion, that's just like baseline treatment, okay? That's not, that's not intensive agriculture. Soil erosion is happening at excessive rates due to poor agricultural management, over generations, as well as the level of seas, the rising level of seas. It's estimated that 30% of arable soils have been lost in the fast, past, last 40 years. So arable soils are those soils that have the air, structural porosity, microbial um, density, community that they can actually grow food. So we have all the technology and knowledge needed to stop the inland soil losses. We just need the wherewithal in terms of our communities knowing what they can do, as well as paradigm shifts in how um, agriculture, agricultural management is funded in India, US, and European agricultural practices. Europe has changed a lot. They do a lot of um, supporting and um, 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 incentivizing green agricultural um, 
methodologies like uh, Europe hedgerows, venturos have become incredibly popular because of their um, biodiversity conservation um, options that they provide, as well as reduced wind, reduced losses due to wind, um, that's both soil losses as well as um, humidity losses or transpirational losses uh, and other, um, it's really an abundance of benefits that hedgerows provide. Manure, find it and pile it. Horse, chicken, whatever. You wanna add that to your compost and your beds. Of course, you can't add too much because it will burn the plants, but certainly incorporating manure, and often you can find people that wanna give it away for free because they can't get rid of it. I really love horse manure, by the way. Um, it's excellent for feeding your little microbial partners and breaking down that soil um, and buffering it, increasing cation exchange capacity, porosity, et cetera. Uh, most soils do have a natural deficit in phosphorus because it leaches readily from the soil. So it moves readily through the soil profile via water. So phosphorus, um, you might want to check on, uh, but over fertilization with phosphorus is a waste of money. Because like I said, it readily leaches from the soils. Uh, and there are other ways for the plants to obtain phosphorus through their microbial membership. So mycorrhizal fungi can be incredibly important in plants' ability to access limited phosphorus. And whereas phosphorus fertilization will actually break down those mutualistic relationships and can actually um, decimate uh, mycorrhizal communities. Let's see. Climate change and impacts on soil. So some of the impacts on soil include air quality is reduced, okay, so we have more pollution um, and that can move into the soil and the microbial communities in the soil. Water quality and quantity is reduced, at least at times. So water quality tends to be more acidic. Um, it can also be reduced with warming summers, warming winters, uh, even if you have a lot of rain in the winter, if you don't have that massive snowpack that you were used to getting that suddenly rushes and waters during the dry spring season, that's gonna have a real impact. It may seem like there's a lot of water coming down, but actually water coming down at the right time in sort of an extended period of time is more important than just you know deluge here and there during the winter. Reduced plant productivity or diversity is also a consequence of climate change. So people have talked about how increased carbon, plants use carbon to make photosynthates or the sugars um, that they do everything with, uh, just like we do. But there's a threshold at which plants can actually increase their productivity as a result of increased carbon. If plants have higher carbon to nitrogen ratios in their leaves and roots as a result of increased carbon absorption from the atmosphere, then they are actually going to break down slower because it's harder for the arthropods and micropods or microbes to break down high C to N ratio plant tissues. So they can really slow down that organic matter accumulation leading to a negative feedback in terms of plants wanting to grow faster and bigger because of carbon, but not having the other resources they need um, because their microbial community has slowed down. Also, increased plant growth usually means a trade-off in terms of plant resistance. So if you have trees that grow fast, those are often considered trash trees because they break down readily um, and can often succumb to diseases faster than, than um, slower growing trees. It's not always the case. Some trees have evolved to grow fast and have evolved some great strategies. But just remember, there's usually a trade-off. You have a limited amount of money in your bank account. If you spend a lot on food, then you have less to spend on healthcare and vice versa. Same for plants. Warm soils tend to negatively impact microbial and arthropod and root communities. Um, they don't get a break. They don't get to metabolically shut down and relax, chill out. Um, and so because they don't get the chance to chill out, they're using a lot more resources. They're, they need to consume a lot more food and they have less to give to defenses. And then of course, too much or too little water. We're having a deluge right now, so that's going to increase the probability of oomycete fungi, pathogenic fungi in the soils around me. Um, 
fish if it stays wet for a significant period of time while the roots are dormant. Uh, and then also um, because we had a warm, wet, almost spring-like winter here, that means the, everything was operating as though it's winter in terms of metabolic activity. And so that lack of rest that the microorganisms, the arthropods, the trees have evolved to have, um, they're not prepared to balance out their resources. And they're probably gonna suffer this summer and spring in terms of resistance to, to pathogens. So here's some citations for some of the pictures and the data that I have referenced in this presentation. I hope this is useful to you guys. I'm not a soil biologist, so I like to pretend I am one on TV, um, but I do uh, have read a lot of the research, certainly use this a lot in my uh, work life. And as a, an evolutionary ecologist, you really can't study plants without studying soils and the trophic levels above them. If you have any questions, please, please reach out to me, ask me here at gmail.com. Or if you have any suggestions or you just want to have a chat about soils, that would be super terrific. How about that? This conference will now be recorded.